Welcome to the Tax Talk Podcast and the third episode in a three-part series with Stefan Van Zanten. Stefan has been a wealth advisor with Bridgeline Wealth since 2020. He focuses his time working with families, private corporations, estates, and family farms. He is always learning and educating himself to better serve his clientele and particularly likes helping people navigate the complexities of estate matters and planning for the next generation. Thank you again, Stefan, for hopping on the podcast. Glad to be here. So, we are looking at successful succession planning today. Mm -hmm. Bit of a mouthful. So today we're going to kind of present a bit of a case and then analyze a series of questions based on the case study facts. So what we're looking at today is a family farm. Mom and dad have been operating that for a number of years, let's say 30-ish years. Farm is currently being operated between them as an unincorporated partnership. Mm -hmm. One son is actively involved in the family and would like to take that on as a lifelong career. The other son has decided to pursue a university teaching career mm -hmm. and has no involvement in the farm whatsoever. So we're just going to kind of analyze the case based on some of these questions and see what we can figure out. Sounds good. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer a couple questions and then uh, I'm going to ask Jared a couple questions as sure. the uh, tax advisor here. So I'm looking forward to hearing what do you have to say on some of these questions. Should be so, fun. Yeah. Should be fun. All right. Question number one. At what time should the parents consider succession opportunities? Yeah, that's a good question. You should always be thinking about that. Um, and you should always be working with your professional team, uh, your wealth advisor and, and your uh, accountant and a lawyer to, to discuss, you know, even as you're planning out wills and, you know, you're periodically updating it, uh, what is the end scenario that you would hope for? And then work your way back from that. Um, I would say so, you know, it really takes shape though as the kids start getting older for sure. and become uh, old enough to then decide what they want to do. For sure. um, it's tough to base to be actually doing succession succession planning if you don't know what the kids are deciding yet. Sure. So let's say on that end. Uh, interesting, when it does come to family succession planning, it's oftentimes more emotional than just a simple business because you've had, uh, as you all well know, for all our farmers listening here, you've had maybe a hundred years of farming in on that land and you want to see that legacy passed on to your children. So there's a lot of emotion tied up to that and that's okay to, to feel it as you're trying to wrap your head around it. The worst thing though you can do is push it off and procrastinate the planning when uh, decisions are needing to be made. Mm -hmm. now, one of the critical things that causes people to start moving in that direction to make these decisions probably in my opinion where they hear their friend who didn't plan mm -hmm. or they hear a family member who uh, unfortunately you know passed away and it left a, a train wreck for the kids so I would say the earlier you can plan the more options you're gonna have so start as early as you can 2016 census of agriculture here in Alberta uh, made a mention that 8.5% of farm operators had a formal, formal succession plan. 8.5. So that's not a lot. Oh. You could be the 8.5 and I said congratulations <laughs> to you. <laughs> well done. For well everyone done. else, the uh, 90 plus percent of people that don't have their succession plan, um, it's going to be important for you to start that conversation and not put it on the shelf until something uh, negative happens. And then 
average age, 56. 56, um, a, a percentage, uh, 56 years old is, is when they're uh, looking for that succession plan. So, sure. yeah. So yeah, I think real quick on my side of that, I just had two quick points, early and often. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, it makes sense to get that plan in place long before it needs yeah. to be there. And then realizing that once you have a plan in place, it's not just a document that goes into the file cabinet and never gets looked at again. You need to be looking at it on a, on a regular basis, updating it. Yeah. And like you mentioned, it is a very emotional process. So being able to invest that time sitting down with the kids because you know, in our case, for instance, I think we've kind of well established that one son's in, one's out. But I think a lot of times in business, you know, especially like you were saying, you know, maybe you've got a few minor kids that are involved in the business. You know, you might anticipate that son one is really interested, but when you sit down with all of them, you might realize that son one has no interest whatsoever mm -hmm. in taking that business over. Whereas, you know, son number three would just love to take it over. But he just hasn't had that opportunity to maybe have a kick at the can to, to yeah. run things yet. So, yeah, well said. so yeah, I think that's that's an important thing is, is having that discussion early, often, and mm -hmm. keep early it on. Yeah, that's sure. really good. Perfect. Number two, has the family sat down to discuss their overall succession ideas? Yeah. Again, coming back to your point, it's you know is parents uh, it's often it's easy for us to assume uh, right. what's going to happen and so I would just say here is communication so key thing is communication sitting down and dialoguing with your children as adults so there's sure. going to be change that takes place and it's going to be really important for you uh, to to sit down and also treat your children with the respect that they deserve especially as you begin to have succession planning conversations um, in that dialogue, make sure you are asking the most important question of all, do you want to take over the business? Right. And then after you've asked the child um, and found out that one of them does want to take over it, I think it's paramount that you also confirm with the other kids and ask them if they would also like to take over the farming business, because we don't know right. until we start yeah. asking, we can just assume. Sure. And then is it okay are you comfortable with us beginning to make formalize a succession plan that will include the whole family, but primarily we're gonna be looking at selling uh, the business or moving farming to the to the uh, son that wants to take over it. So I would, that would just be a, a response to that question for sure. Yeah, that's a good point. I think as you begin these discussions, that's when you start to lay out the goals of each party, you know, when do mom and dad want to maybe relinquish some of that control? When does that son want to fully take over? You know, what are mom and dad's plans into retirement? Do they want to stay on the farm? You know, as you kind of have these discussions, a lot more questions will probably arise on the onset than you would ever anticipate, but you've got to be able to start somewhere set out some of those initial goals and then you'll be able to kind of work that succession plan to make it fit for everybody that's involved yeah so. and on that note as well if if what happens if none of the kids want to take over the farm so in this case what it you know the one son's farming the other son's teaching i believe that was mm -hmm. uh but we find out that the son was just looking to get out of dodge he just doesn't want to work with on the farm anymore realizing he hates it so now what happens in that scenario is if both kids don't want to have the farm well the succession plan is actually pretty simple it's sad but you sell right. all the assets and after you've uh, taken care of your your retirement needs um, then the successors get the leftovers right. um, in liquid assets for sure the, the other option is, uh, or it becomes sim simple too, if we have one that does want to take over and the other one that uh, doesn't want to, and we have uh, enough liquid assets outside of the farm, then you can start to have those, those simple succession plans in place where I think the difficulty is 
is when we have um, lots of assets but no liquidity. Mm -hmm. And we have one child that wants to take over the farm and one that doesn't. So now we have to start diving down a, a proper planning road. But I think that's uh, where a lot of farms and uh, moms and dads find themselves. Yeah, and it boils back then again to that early and often, you know, making sure that you're well prepared if you do have the two kids that are in different positions, one's wanting to take on the farm, one isn't, how you equalize those assets going forward. So if you plan well ahead of time, it's it's relatively easy and straightforward to, to put those plans into place. If you leave these things to the last minute, you might not be able to, you know, move that farm off to the child that's looking for it. You might not be able to distribute assets in a fashion that keeps everybody happy at the end of the day. So early and often always uh, yeah. helps facilitate yeah. that a little bit better. Early and often. And then the last thing I would just say is really embrace change. So as you go into dive into this area, it's going to be emotional and it's going to be complex and there's going to be um, lots of dialogue and, and change that is needed on your part, uh, the successor's part. Uh, so just be okay with being patient through the complexity. So that, that's just one thing. Don't, don't rush. And if you can plan often and on a regular basis, you won't have to be in a rush. Yeah. Good points. Number three, are critical documents in order and accessible? I know we've kind of talked on these in the first two episodes of this little mini series I guess just a quick recap of some of the things that the family might want to be collecting now to make sure that as they get down the process of figuring out the succession that they have the proper documents in place yeah make sure you have your updated will in a safe place um, make sure you have if you have incorporated make sure you have the partners agreement in place as well um, you know, life insurance documents, uh, investment documents. Uh, in the will, you're also going to have uh, who, who your PR is going to be, or also known as an executor. So those are all important. Keep them in a safe place. Uh, you have three options. We mentioned this in the role of the executor a couple podcasts ago, mm -hmm. but just you've got three options. One is you can have it at a bank mm -hmm. and a safety deposit box. Just remember, it's. Way, it's very secure, but it's also hard to access. If someone passes away, typically those are frozen, um, unfortunately. <laughs> yep. So if you need to pay bills and you find that you re were relying on a safety deposit box to access insurance documents, um, good luck. <laughs> the second option is gonna be having it at a home safety deposit or home safe. So, which is great because it's safe, it's safe, and it's easier to access. Sure. And the other option is going to be a file, file cabinet, which isn't safe, but it's much more easier to access. So, True. find what's comfortable for you, and make sure that you uh, put all your documents into one place, and also update your PR, your executive, uh, executor, to to let them know where the documents are. Otherwise, it's going to take a while. And I guess following up on that, when you get to the point where you've maybe had some of those initial discussions amongst the family, you're ready to maybe put some plans into you know, action, whether you reach out to you know, the accountant, the lawyer, wealth advisor, wherever it is that you're you know, usually the most comfortable with or we spend the most amount of time with is probably the professional that you might start this journey on. Mm -hmm. They're all going to be intertwined in this, but no matter who it is that you start with, they're likely going to be asking for all of these documents to ensure that they have all the information possible to put their kind of puzzle pieces together and then provide you with the best possible advice. So like Stefan said, having all these documents in one place, they're readily available, you can bring them into that initial meeting, tick off a bunch of the boxes, 
and then that way you're you're providing that full story up front and we're not having to kind of hunt and peck to, to figure out <laughs> little pieces of the puzzle yeah, when uh, we just want to, to do things as efficiently as possible to ensure that that plan is a, you know effective as possible yeah. so yeah that's that's a great point perfect I got on the hot okay. seat. All right, all right. I got a question for you. Sure, let's do it. Has okay. So when we're talking about uh, valuation, mm -hmm. this is question four. Sure. Has the farm been uh, valued, mm -hmm. and and who should they connect with to get their farm and all the assets valued? Should they go to a real estate agent? Is a real estate agent going to be able to check all those boxes, or is there someone who's going to be more skilled? For sure. at doing this so I think probably gonna start with the old boilerplate response it depends I think with the farm you're probably in a fairly unique situation where you might need input from a number of people so typically if we have clients that are maybe just doing a minor reorganization maybe to free shares to the husband so the wife can get in the process is fairly straightforward, usually will kind of help the client with those types of services. When we get into this farming situation, where we've got mom and dad, they've been farming for 30 plus years, they probably have a significant amount of land, equipment, inventory, et cetera, et cetera. I think we've kind of moved beyond the realm of maybe having just the accountant deal with this valuation. Right. One of the biggest reasons being is Mom and dad are, in a sense, a party, and then you have the son as another party. Mm -hmm. And probably traditionally speaking, maybe the accountants work with mom and dad for maybe that entire 30 years. There's probably a fairly well-developed mm -hmm. relationship there. But when we're talking about transferring the farm, you know, it might be wise in some circumstances to have that third party look at some of these valuation things to ensure that, you know, there's no conflict of interest in between the parents and the son. So that would kind of bring in a couple of people. If you need to obviously go down the road to get the land valued, you're probably going to look at a, a real estate right. agent of some kind, probably preferably someone that deals in the ag industry, has a bit of experience there. I find personally a lot of clients have a good idea as to what their land is valued. I don't think that we necessarily need go down that road in the past yeah. but it's something to kind of consider and then in speaking a few episodes ago with Justin Lamb out of Edmonton he is the chartered business valuator you know and he does a lot of work you know with the farms small businesses etc to kind of help them set that overall value taking mm -hmm. into consideration yeah. you know the equipment inventories land you know future cash flows and things of that nature so I think depending on the size of that farming operation, you know, you can probably input a lot of those numbers yourself because you're probably fairly well versed at what things are worth and, and where you can find some of that information. But it might be worth it depending on the size of the the overall farming operation to maybe pull that third party in to, yeah. to get that extra little bit of advice. Okay, so this is what every farmer is thinking right now. What's it gonna cost me? If I had to if I had to go get someone of, of this right. skill, how much would that cost me per million? Do you have that off the top of your head, or do they have to contact um, someone like Justin Lamb? Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, off the top of my head, I think the valuations he said started at around four to five thousand. Yeah. I don't recall kind of the size of the operation of that, but that would probably get you in the door, get things moving, and. Mm -hmm. I think following up with him would definitely be kind of a good place to start to get a bit of a better idea as to, you know, the need and then some of the, the reciprocating fees yeah. on that side of things. That's, I think that's actually not too bad, especially if it's going to give peace of mind on both sides of the party. For sure. Um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty good. I still also see that's probably, you know, when, in a worst case scenario when there has been property fine and people have passed away and now there's uh there's there's court cases going yeah. on uh, I'm sure Justin would be one of those guys that would come in and do an evaluation for sure yeah 
Yeah, I think a lot of his business is in the happy times when you're trying to move that business on. Yeah. Friendly succession planning, but a lot of it is also litigation work, mm -hmm. albeit estate courses, divorce agreements, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, if, if there is any inherent risk, I guess, of those things cropping up down the road, it would probably be wise to have that third party to support some of those numbers. So not too bad, 4,000. Roughly, yeah, to get you five thousand get you started. Sure, sure. Okay, uh, I think I got another one. Uh, all right, is the unincorporated partnership the right structure going forward? So we've got farmers who are uh, they've been unincorporated for a long, long time, and they don't see any reason why they should get incorporated because they can run the write-offs like uh, yeah. you know. Uh, for their own business, but not have to incorporate. So what would be a benefit for this particular couple to consider incorporating when they're succession planning? For sure. So we see this quite often when the family farm is getting to this stage. Mom and dad have run it for a number of years, kids want to get involved. Now is probably a good time to move away from the partnership biggest probably reason that you want to look at at that juncture is like you mentioned typically as that partnership you know mom and dad are still have the option to you know prepay some seed or buy some fertilizer before the end of the year to kind of work with those inventory adjustments manage the tax that way typically what happens when you get to this stage however you're getting to the point where you're kind of beyond using those deferrals to manage the tax on a regular basis. You've established the farm to a point where the cash flow that is coming in just kind of exceeds the, I guess the operational usefulness for some of these deferrals. Yeah, you could go and spend X hundred thousands of dollars on this, 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 and that, mm -hmm. but does that make sense in an operational standpoint? It's probably starting to, to cease. Typically at the same point in time, you've got a fair amount of personal income that's ending up with mom and dad on their partnership statements, on their personal income tax return. So between the two, you know, it's probably starting to t look at the time to say, let's incorporate this. It's gonna give us access to additional corporate deferral options gain access to that small business rate mm -hmm. and then it's going to allow them to you know pivot from what they be doing for the last number of years and allow son that's coming in to keep building that business at that smaller rate mm -hmm. as opposed to him coming on maybe paying some higher personal taxes and having to grow and reinvest in the business at that juncture so usually I would probably say, and again, it depends on the values, but you know, if you've been operating for 30 years, you probably have a fairly sizable farming operation. So it's probably time to look at the idea of bringing in that incorporated entity, moving all the assets in that way. So what would be, uh, what would be the drawbacks of incorporating? Because you hear, you hear a lot of things. Okay. Um, you know what? What would be a drawback that you'd see for for this case scenario? Yeah, um, I guess early on, what I've seen from personal experience, there's a lot of added complexity mm -hmm. to it versus maybe the way things were done before. If you've been operating that farm, you had a December year end for a couple of decades now you're having to move all these assets in there you're dealing with maybe not a calendar year end you've got a new set of books that you've got to bring in you've got to deal with again valuing all these items and bringing them in there's a lot i think within that transition period that can be a bit complex once i've seen these farming corporations up and running for you know, I'd say at least two years, things generally smooth out from there. You kind of get into a, a rhythm as right. to 
you know, this is the production cycle, this is when we need to buy things if we're looking to kind of defer some income, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, you're into the flow of CRA compliance again and when GST returns are due. So yeah, there is that bit of added complexity, but as far as I've seen, it's only really lasted for a short interim period, mm -hmm. and then you see the, the benefits beyond that. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. Hopefully that helps uh, all the listeners there. Um, I know when my parents uh, did succession planning with my two brothers, they passed on the family business. And they said it wasn't until they actually incorporated that they started making money. <laughs> so, and, and part of that also happens because uh, you, I think there's a bit of an accountability when yep, you're when you're sure. actually realizing, oh, I'm gonna have to pay additional tax on drawing money out of the corp. Yep. Um, and then the other thing is just the you know the, the personal income tax uh, costs. I mean, a high interest, high high income tax brackets at forty six percent, and uh, at the corporate level for active business, it's eleven percent. Mm -hmm. So that's a thirty percent, just around a thirty percent spread. That's a pretty decent amount that you would save uh, for the cash flow side of things. So when you turn that from a, a million dollars and you do 30%, it's significant. Yep. So that does make sense why uh, someone would want to consider incorporating. Sure. Okay, uh, if you're deciding to incorporate, what would the scenario look like uh, if they were to, uh, how do they start? Sure. So kind of like we mentioned, we've got to value everything first. Yeah. Whether that comes from internal discussions, you know, you have to get some analysis from the real estate broker, or you sit down with someone like Justin to get that full chartered valuation put into place. That's where you got to start. From that point in time, you get that corporation set up. As always, we advise chat with a lawyer to get this structured, especially in this case, because you're gonna have, you know, mom and dad, you want the son to get separate shares, you wanna ensure that the structure is put together correctly. So once you have that corporation in place, then what we're gonna to put together is a, a rollover. And then, so what we're doing here is we're taking the assets that the farming partnership had, and we're gonna roll those into the corporation. And by doing this, we are avoiding what CRA would otherwise deem to be a disposition from the partnership right. into the corporation, which, if you had some accrued gains, would trigger tax. Mm -hmm. We want the farm to continue on without incurring this huge tax liability by bringing the sun on. Mm -hmm. So by filing the applicable paperwork based on the values, we can roll all these assets into the corporation and kick all that tax down the road. So essentially what happens is whatever the value of these particular assets is that we put into the company, mm -hmm. mom and dad take back preferred shares that have a fair market value equal to those assets. So that kind of preserves mom and dad's stake in this farming mm -hmm. operation over the long term that can translate into you know a way to get some retirement dollars out of the farm and then at that juncture like i kind of mentioned briefly then common shares are issued to mom dad and the son mm -hmm. preferably all separate this shares. Be the farming son yep okay yep. yep all preferably separate classes of shares. That way, if you need to pay dividends, you've got some flexibility as to how you want to pay those out. And then basically at that junction, you've taken the necessary steps to legally move the assets from the partnership into the corporate entity without incurring a massive tax bill. Perfect. And, and to begin this process, do they have to dive into this set of weeds by themselves, or do they come? <laughs> which which professional do they come to see? Do they come to see the wealth advisor, the lawyer, or do they come and see the accountant? Who would be the best fit? This aspect is going to be heavy on the accounting mm -hmm. side. Like I kind of mentioned before, you could probably start the conversation anywhere. You know, if you are say the lawyer is a family friend and you have been working with him a lot over the past 30 years, 
maybe you bring in your documents and you say we're thinking about getting son one into the farm what are some of our options yeah. that lawyer should be able to sit there and say well we could continue on as we are or we could possibly look mm -hmm. at incorporating the, the farm at this juncture so I, I think start where you feel most comfortable yeah. Yeah. yeah and then if you are working with a professional that is worth his or her value <laughs> they should be contacting other professionals yes. to ensure that you know you're getting the entire holistic treatment as far as what needs to be done yeah and i think i think honestly probably the place that you're going to want to really you're going to be directed and where i'm going to direct you is going to go to the accountant For sure. um, so you can start making some of these uh these plans that are going to involve uh, a lot of tax so it's going to be a lot of tax that sure. you're lifting and so that's that's going to be a good good portion all right next question here is should the land remain in personal names gotcha initially i would definitely say yes mm -hmm. um a couple of reasons for that so just let me clarify do we want to incorporate the land or do we want to keep it personally held so in most cases when you're looking at this particular case study i would say the equipment the inventory those types of assets you would roll in to the farming corporation if mom and dad hold land via that partnership they should continue just to hold that in personal names not put it into the code okay why why is it so important that we don't incorporate the land just after we finish saying all these wonderful things about <laughs> the tax benefits there's this is really important listeners listen For sure so the reason being is you know the land presuming it continues to qualify as eligible farm property is going to give rise to that lifetime gap capital gains exemption yes as properties moved into that farm corp the family farm corp shares are also going to qualify but basically when you're getting into this position where you've got probably a significant chunk of land probably a fairly sizable value put into that corporation via the equipment etc you're going to get up and above that lifetime capital gains exemption probably quite quickly mm -hmm. So keeping the title on the land where it is keeps things simple. As you go along in the succession planning, we refer back to son two, mm -hmm. who was deciding to take on a teaching career at a university. He doesn't want anything to do with the farm, which is fine. But if we have the family farm corp owning the operational assets, mom and dad owning the land mm -hmm. itself, it then gives us more options on how to eventually distribute their estate. If you start off this corporation and you move everything into the corp, basically the only asset that mom and dad have left them are the shares of this corporation. So you're going to severely restrict the options with which you can distribute value, assets, etc., down the road. Whereas if you keep those broke off, maybe the operation goes to son one who's farming, maybe one quarter or whatever goes along with him, but maybe a few quarters then go to son two, and then you've equalized the estate right. quite easily that way. Plans could be put into place that son two has to rent that farmland back to son one for mm -hmm. X amount of time. Maybe son one has write a first refusal on that property so he's able to purchase that up keep that in in the farming operation down the road but essentially what it's doing is it gives you flexibility right and that's probably the most important thing at this juncture gives you okay that's good um so essentially what we don't want to do is put it all into the corporation right away uh we want to be able to keep the land separate sure. so that we have great more options and uh, you know, as time progresses, hopefully there's clarity on, on what the next steps are. So hopefully that, that's a good answer for all of you. Wondering on that end, um, sure. it's a good answer for me. All right, uh, 
here's another one. How will control of the farm change? So how will control of the farm change as it moves from mom and dad's hands into the successor holder's hands? For sure. So yeah, up until this point, dad, mom and dad have just kind of operated 50-50. Yeah. Now when we move into incorporation, you have the ability to set those initial common shares. Mm -hmm. You know, do mom and dad take 60% of the stake, the balance goes to the son. Do mom and dad take 80%, the son gets 20 to begin with. You know, that's a discussion that needs to be had. That initial setting of those common shares is going to determine how the growth of that farming operation kind of transpires over the next course of time. So say you incorporate mom and dad take back 80% of the common share, someone only has 20%. Say mom and dad want to farm for another 10 years. Well, in that 10 year period, they will have accumulated 80% of the value from the initial point of incorporation to the day that they maybe decide to get out or start slowing down. So that may not be the most efficient way to do things because I would probably typically say at this juncture, mom and dad are probably already planning for that exit. So when you're incorporating, you probably want to see that the son is maybe taking a good chunk mm -hmm. of those common shares so that the value that you gain post incorporation is accruing to the son. Because mom and dad probably have a fairly significant preferred share balance, like we mentioned earlier, that they can draw down on in retirement. They probably don't need to keep building on the growth of the family. So that's something to consider. But at the same point in time, and I think this is, you know, applicable for all businesses. Mom and dad might want to bring in the son, but they might not want to give up control. So you can structure the company in a way that, yeah, maybe the value is, you know, accumulating to son one, but the, the votes on the shares that mom and dad hold maybe have a bit more value for a certain period of time. And as things progress, then you're able to maybe relinquish some of that control via the voting rights and then that way the son can eventually take over kind of the ownership that way as well right okay so it's going to take uh, again this is where we're going to take time we're going to evaluate we're going to have these conversations ongoing with your accountant okay now as much <laughs> as i appreciate our bookkeeper uh, and bookkeepers out there uh, the ones that are holding up as accountants, just be wary of, okay? Uh, this is what you just heard, and as you got lost halfway through, <laughs> <laughs> this is why you're paying an accountant to do the heavy thinking right. for you, okay? So just keep that in mind. Uh, for sure. Yeah. I think you got a question from me here. I do have okay. one for you. Okay. What okay. are the income expectations of the parents of retirement? Okay, that's a good question. Uh -huh. So it really depends on what they want to do in retirement. Sure. Do they want to sell the land or um, buy an RV and go travel North America right. for 15 years? That's going to that's gonna be a bit costly, uh, especially if they sell their home um, and they want to do that. Or are they going to work out a plan with the kids and they're going to say, hey kids, I would really like to just stay in my already paid for house. You guys can build your property here. Sure. We've checked with the county. It's okay. Uh, and, and then you can, and then you find out they don't even want a vacation. They just right. want to linger. Right. Okay, so the planning is going to look a little different. I would also have the conversation about what is the, uh, what are you going to do when your, your body is starting to wear down, hmm. right? Uh, it might be difficult for public health nurses to traverse the, the winters right. to come see you. So it might be imperative that you also include plans for what happens when that time does come and you do need a, additional help. Right. So that is going to be an important part of that, that plan and uh, what your expectations are for your 
the money that you need to. Really, it's gonna come down to really running a financial plan. Mm -hmm. This is what we do all the time, we run financial plans, and we can kind of have a good, solid idea as to how much money you need into retirement mm -hmm. and uh, to accomplish your retirement uh, goals and really enjoy the golden period of, of life without stressing. Sure. So I would just say uh, on that level, it's uh, gonna be important. The other thing I'd also mention is you may not have the same write-offs mm. that you once enjoyed. Very good point. Right, so you, the vehicles, the depreciation, right, you're no mm. longer um, running the, the ownership of the business. So make sure you consult with your accountant and uh, bring those numbers over to us to take a peek at so that the proper plan is placed and not just the, <laughs> the wishful plan. For sure. The last thing I'd also notice with CPP, oftentimes, because there's lower employee income uh, claimed on the farm, right. your CPP, your uh, pension is going to be a lot lower than other folks that are getting a full pension because they paid into right. the pension. So just something to keep in consideration, sure. um, especially if you, if this couple here is starting around 50 in their 50s, they should really be looking at um, what their assets are doing for returns, mm -hmm. and then also what their alternative investments are doing to, uh, to keep up with that, right. so that they're gonna have a, a good retirement. For sure. Okay. So yeah, just to close that one off, I think it makes sense to come have that discussion with you at this juncture, again, bringing in mm -hmm. all those professionals yeah. to say this is kind of our long-term plan these are the pieces we got in place. Mm -hmm. This is what we want to do. How do I make this work? Yeah. So yeah. go talk to Stefan. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to, love to share a copy. And for sure. Figure that out. Oh, that puzzle piece for you. Uh, okay. Got a question for Jared. All right. How would the corporation fund the parents' eventual retirement? For sure. So as you just kind of mentioned, chances are if you run that farm operation for 30 some odd years, you've probably done all you possibly can not to pay the tax man, mm -hmm. which then transfers into not paying any CPP on that personal tax return. So yeah, you probably don't have a, a huge CPP pension. Chances are if you've put in 30 years into the farm, you probably don't have a whole lot of dollars in RSPs or anything of that nature. Your retirement plan is the farm, mm -hmm. plain and simple. So as we kind of mentioned before, when we're moving from that partnership into incorporation, someone's coming on, he's taking over control, as mom and dad phase out, all of that value in the equipment, et cetera, et cetera, that mom and dad have is now kind of locked up in the preferred shares, and then they've also got that land on the, the side that they're still holding personally. Chances are we don't want to touch the land, we want to keep farming that, we want to keep that in the family, that's probably just going to stay pat. So we're looking at those preferred shares. Basically what's going to happen, depending on when you decide to maybe start slowing things down, you're going to start redeeming some of those preferred shares. And what that's going to do is that's going to translate into dividend income to mom and dad. Depending on when you start redeeming these shares and depending on what the corporate income looks like at the time that you start redeeming these, you're either going to get these dividends out as non-eligible dividends, so you're going to be paying slightly higher personal tax, but less than what you would see as if you were right taking 38%. Yeah, less than what you would see as a, a wage. Mm -hmm. If the corporation has gone on for a number of years, you're starting to earn some profits in excess of 500,000, like we see with a number of our farm and family corporations, you're gonna have some income that's in that high rate pool. So yes, you pay a bit more corporate tax, but then you've got some funds that you can then take out as eligible dividends, so then those become taxed at- so They kind of offset each other. Yeah, at quite low personal rates. So depending on how things work, and I guess you know, the agreements you put into place, you, know, you can determine the length of time that you know, mom and dad want to see some of these preferred shares redeemed at. You've got to also 
you know, consider the farming operation and the cash flows there to make sure you're not drawing out too much cash that you need for operations. But that is going to be basically your retirement vehicle, those preferred shares. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good answer. And it does really raise one little flag in my mind when it comes to, uh, you know, folks, and we think about it on the investment scale, uh, have you diversified your portfolio, right? Or, or are all your eggs in one basket? You know, when you drop that basket or the one of these sons, uh, there's an issue and, and they can't take over the farm even though they want to take over the farm. Um, or, you know, we can imagine other scenarios. Have you diversified your portfolio? Because really the farm is part of your uh, it's in your investment vehicle that you're banking on to retire. And if that were to collapse, what else do you have in place? Sure. So just something to discuss with your advisor. Diversify your portfolio um, would be just a, a little helpful reminder there. Sure. And I think that boils back to the early and often. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you don't need to be 60 to put in a succession plan. You don't need yeah. to be 60 to start planning for yeah. retirement. You should be doing these things quite early. I mean, son one who's looking to get into this should be putting in yeah. his own succession yeah. slash retirement plan to That's ensure point. he's preparing yeah. for the same things that yeah. mom and dad are dealing with. That's a good point. Um, all right, I think this one is for me. Okay. Yeah. 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 What are some areas to watch for when managing retirement funds? You've kind of briefly touched on this, yeah. but... Uh, well, people don't plan on two things. Number one, they don't plan on how long they live. Okay, sure. Oftentimes people are just, they think they're gonna be passing away sooner. Uh, I have a little bit of data that's proving uh, <laughs> that the 2021 census, most recent figures released by Statistics Canada show that the number of Canadians aged 100 or older mm -hmm. has increased from just 1,065 for centennials in 1971 sure. to 9,545 in the 21, 2021 census. So people are living longer. And, uh, you know, statistics are around 84, 86 um, no, okay. right now on average. So just make sure that you are planning uh, to not outlive your money. Right. And uh, especially when we think about the CPP pension, if it's not being paid into, we've okay. only got uh, old age security. And, and maybe which a little, nominal. which is nominal. Yeah. And uh, maybe just a little bit of uh, GIS. Uh, yeah, depending on, yeah, depending on the situation. Which, yeah. which is uh, pennies. Yes. So yes. if you're living on $70,000, 80000 150 uh, you could be living at 30000 um, which is not a lot. So just keep that in mind. And the other thing is inflation. So from 1960 to 2022, average inflation is, was 3.8%. Um, so that's an increase of 886%. Fun. Yeah. So every year, there's inflation. There's a silent robber. And it doesn't matter if you hide your money um, underneath your bed, the robber always steals it. It just means that your, your money has less power, less purchase power. So keeping those two things in mind when we are uh, thinking about managing retirement funds is a key thing when we're looking at our clients. And we wanna have a proper return um, that's going to allow you to sleep at night and that works in line with your personal plan. So I would just say that those are some good comments. Makes sense, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right, is there sufficient cash flow to maintain the entire family, Jared, through the farm operations? So when we're talking about cash flow, mm -hmm. and we're talking about succession planning, is there gonna be significant, significant cash flow that's gonna last them through mm -hmm. this time, including when, when parents are starting to withdraw money? Right. It's a very important question to, to figure out ahead of time because like we've kind of mentioned before, you've got separate parties. Mom and dad want to maybe retire. Maybe son's just getting married. Maybe he's just having kids. We're in completely different spheres of life here now. 
So it's important to have an understanding well ahead of time as to what the cash flow of the business looks like, when mom and dad are going to be taking these dollars out, what is needed to be put back in to keep pushing the farm forward. You know, do we need a new combine? Do we need a new tractor? You know, what are these things looking like? So that biggest piece of the puzzle, you know, those preferred chairs. How many are there? How many years do we expect mom and dad to be retired? Are we planning for those years that are maybe beyond what we anticipate maybe living? We need to make sure that we take all these things into consideration. And then like you kind of mentioned, we need to understand all of these external factors that are impacting farmers these days. So carbon tax, you know, there's a lot of foreign exchange inefficiencies these yeah. days. Inflation, various crop input increases due to government policies. So there's a lot of things that have to be taken into consideration by the entire farm family to understand that while we may have incorporated today, things will probably look a lot different in the future. So again, early and often, planning these things out ahead of time and ensuring that mom and dad are, are comfortable when they retire. You know, they put in a lot of work to build the farm to where it got to and you want to see that they're able to, you know, if they want to go down to Phoenix every year, that they're able to go down to Phoenix. You want to be able to ensure that they're taken care of and that they're not falling back on OAS and GIS payments late in life because that's just not the way anybody wants to see <laughs> legacy continue on. So having a good understanding of your books, I think is important. Like you had mentioned before, there's probably a, a bit of a stark difference between running things personally and then moving into that corporation. You know, maybe having that you know, personal partnership, things get a little bit blurred as far as, you know, what is a personal expense, what's not. Maybe there's a bit more of a adherence to what needs to be figured out once it's incorporated. So having a good solid foundation, having a good bookkeeper in place, ensuring that the, the farming records can be relied upon to make those decisions going forward is going to be important. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, you know, I think if you, if this, in this particular case, if uh, the farming son wants to take over, uh, what we could see is uh, a unique structure put in place where we have two old coasts owning shares within the corporation, uh, which owns the assets. Mm -hmm. And then there would be uh, some uh, dividends can be kicked out to the old coast and then dropped into the, the hands of the, the owners of this old coast, which would be the parents and then um, the farming son. And then what we could have is a loan that the son has to pay mom and dad for those those shares, so that's that's a great uh, option to consider because we need liquidity on the parent side, and so once that is in place, I think that helps uh, check a couple boxes for the, the parents to have liquidity, sure. uh, and for the son to have ownership. Sure. And I imagine that that's how the parents also had that that land that part may have been given it to them, sure. but part of it was probably purchased with their own sweat and tears so there's that ownership there but something to really consider is with the son now having a loan if he changes his mind probably have a, a contract written up that says that parents have a, a right of refusal first right of refusal to purchase that back right. and then for the son to have a critical illness and disability on him to make sure that those that loan is being paid off even while he's recovering if he gets sick. Right. If he has an illness or he's injured himself and he's no longer able to work on the farm, that's a big expense. Right. Um, and we see all the, the, the plan begin to, to fall apart and really affect mom and dad's transition into retirement. Right. So just a couple of comments on that end. Sure. Second last question. Oh, wow. <laughs> Doing good. What should be taken into consideration when we're talking estate planning and equalization? Yeah. So you may have heard this before, but equal doesn't mean fair. Right. Um, you know, 
it's nice if we can say, I have $100 and son, you get $50 and the other son gets $50. But uh, it's not the same, not the case when it comes to this particular case. Uh, in, this, in this case scenario, I think it represents a lot of farming families. Um, so the son would most likely get uh, part of the land, he'd get the farming assets or the farming equipment and, and maybe a little bit of liquidity and his in the will is that may be going to be forgiven um, if they were to pass away. But what's, what happens to the, the other son? You know, I, I'm pretty sure farmers like both sons. Um, let's hope. Presumably. Uh, but in this case, I know that uh, I've talked with the case, case couple, and they do. They like both sons. So they want to make provisions for this, this other son who's teaching. And there's a couple ways that can be done. Right. Um, if there is liquidity, if there is you know, assets outside sure. of the farm, uh, they could distribute it out that way, um, setting in place on their will, and then updating their will early and often. Right. Or they could have part of it shown in the land portion. The, and then that, what would happen is the other son would lease it off of him, which would be a, uh, an agreement there that said the, the farming son has the first right of refusal to purchase land. The issue that I find that takes place is the value of land has been increasing significantly, farmland. And so the thing that comes into my mind is, will that farming son have enough liquidity or will he get approved mm -hmm. to purchase that land? Right. If not, then now we're gonna to start to have a little bit of family drama because one wants to sell and the other one wants the land and now the other one's gonna be neighbors to someone he doesn't wanna be neighbors to. Right. So there could just be issues that are created. One of the best effective uh, vehicles that we found in this scenario is, is probably to have a, a joint mass to die mm -hmm. uh, insurance that way we have the son taken care of right. it can also provide uh, the additional funds to pay off let's say RSPs or RIFs right. that would be a, a big blow to the estate and then uh, provide a little bit of leftover cash flow to the the other son who's farming um, so I would say Life insurance would definitely be a great uh, vehicle to look at sure. when we're succession planning. For sure. yeah. yeah, so I think there are a lot of options there if you get to things early enough. If you wait until you know, mom or dad are passing and you try to do some of this planning you know, at the end point, it, it becomes a little bit more tricky. So. You know, if the life insurance route is the way to go, it's probably better to get on that boat yeah. early often because you know the premiums are going to be a lot lower. You know, as you age, you might you know come up with some sort of condition that you know, disqualifies you from being even able to access insurance. Yeah. So, you know, addressing these things early on is just going to give you so many more planning opportunities yeah. to be able to you know, distribute the assets as you see fit and preserve that farming legacy in the way that you see fit. Yeah. So. And one other thing I would just make a note on, you could have it personally held, but sometimes it makes sense to have uh, the joint last to die held within the corporation. So what that accomplishes is a couple things is you're paying it at the corporate level as opposed to the personal level. Right. So again, when we go back to the income tax and we think about 30%, you know, that's gonna be a nice uh, savings because if it is a whole life policy, it's not gonna be cheap, right. but it will help accomplish the intended purposes. The other thing is it can be distributed uh, through the CDA credits uh, into the hands of the uh, folks tax-free. Right. So, That'll be a nice, a nice uh, check, uh, something to check all the boxes there, for sure. and something that you should talk with your uh, advisor on yeah. in that regards. Okay, last question. Wrap her up, Jared. What is the tax impact of the eventual passing 
of the parents. For sure. Again, probably depends on the exact situation, what assets you have, et cetera, et cetera. Important to watch. I know a lot of people, small boat, small business owners alike, you know, they come in and they say, well, can't I just gift it? You know, in a lot of cases, you know, especially as far as the, the farming corp shares, etc. You know, if they're not qualifying for the exemptions, you're going to have a disposition of fair market value. Even if cash isn't received, you're going to have a bunch of tax owing there. Maybe you're not going to get the, the bump up on the cost to the kids that you were anticipating on those gifts. So watch what you're gifting, making sure that uh, those rules are kind of followed. Um, basically, at the end of the day, like I kind of mentioned before, a lot of these different assets, the land, you know, whether it's equipment outside of a corporation or if it's shares within that family farming corp, likely if things have been structured correctly, are going to be able to you know, gain access to that capital gains exemption. You know, always making sure that you're working with your accountant to purify that business. So as that you know, farm court grows, you're moving the excess cash out, you're holding any, you know, investments with Stefan in that holding company yeah, as opposed yeah. to within that farming operation, that way you're preserving that capital gains exemption. Mm -hmm. So those are, you know, important things to do. Typically, you know, say dad passes first, you know, everything's going to move over to mom on a tax deferred basis. So it gives you a bit of a mm -hmm. reprieve That's there. Right. Yeah. You know, that kind of works. But what the, happens after? Yep. Yeah. Okay. What happens after? So, yeah, again, that works into that last to die right. insurance policy that you had mentioned. You know, everything moves from dad to mom. That mm -hmm. insurance policy yeah. is still in place, gives some protection down the road. So, then what happens when mom passes? Well, you're probably going to trigger tax all over the place here now. So, yeah, you can use up these exemptions. Um, you're going to be able to presumably roll some of the property over on a tax deferred basis. So you've got some options, making sure that everything's still qualified, et cetera, et cetera. Probably your biggest piece here then is just ensuring that things are ending up where they're supposed to go. And then from that point on, they're being handled correctly. So say for instance, you know, you incorporate maybe the will doesn't get put into place correctly or it doesn't get updated. So upon passing of mom and dad, maybe the shares of that family corp are going to both of the sons. Mm -hmm. Well, now we probably put ourselves into a place that we don't necessarily want as far as operations go. You know, son two that's working that university mm -hmm. career, he's probably just gonna want his cash out of the, yeah. the family farm corp. So that puts son number one into a bit of a, yeah. a bind as to, you know, how's he going to pay his brother out when he's got maybe a, a completely different operation to take care of. Maybe there was a bunch of estate taxes that were owed, et cetera, et cetera. So having things set up correctly in the will to ensure that they're passed along correctly is probably the biggest thing, like you mentioned before. Mm -hmm some insurance in place yeah. to cover off some of that tax is going to be an important thing and then just planning ahead as to you know maybe how the land is treated if that becomes a significant part of son two's estate mm -hmm. you know is there an agreement in place that allows someone to rent that off of him to right. buy it down the road that type of thing so yeah there are a whole number of exemptions that are available whether you hold that property personally via a partnership or those family corp shares there's a bunch of rollovers you can take advantage of so just being aware of all these circumstances and most importantly keeping that farming operation quote unquote pure as far as cra views it to ensure that you are qualifying for the exemptions and the rollovers is going to be the most important thing. So, the best way to mitigate taxes, <laughs> this is what every farmer's thinking right now, right. how do I avoid the taxes? Right. How, you're the accountant, how do I avoid the taxes if my spouse passed, I, I passed away and my spouse passes away, right. how do I avoid the taxes? For sure. And the answer is? And the answer is, so, 
obviously you've got some kids that are involved in this you've got the availability to intergenerational roll those shares or the property etc over you've got those exemptions available to you so you know when dad passes it's probably good to look to maybe use up some of his exemption at that point in time if he hasn't because then you're going to bump the cost of say the land to mom then when mom passes she's already got this bumped up cost on the land so you're able to multiply those capital gains exemptions whereas if you just kind of exclude some of this planning you roll everything over at cost mm -hmm. maybe you're foregoing some of these exemptions not taking advantage of some uh, things okay. so again it's that early and often planning getting all the pieces into place and ensuring that you have that proper plan in place that you know not only kind of plans for the expected like you had kind of mentioned but some of those unexpected things you know the disabilities the deaths that may be unexpected that you know which land holds what costs what you're going to be able to do with the capital gains exemption when someone passes how you can kind of distribute some of that over some of the assets does it make more sense to to do that within some of the shares versus the land you know what are some of the underlying tax attributes of you know the equipment and right. stuff like that so it all depends on you know how things are set up but it's important to speak ahead of time with your accountant mm -hmm. and keep those good records on hand because you know it can be tricky like you had mentioned before maybe some of this farmland mom and dad inherited from their parents or even further down the road so having all these records in place so you're able to establish some of those cost base some of those old tax returns that might have some of these disposals that when it came from one generation down being able to establish those values is going to be able to set you up to keep taking advantage of those exemptions and keep kind of deferring that tax on because yeah the last thing you want to do is see this whole operation move into that next generation with this huge tax bill that people aren't able to manage yeah. and then you're going to have to liquidate assets in order to pay for things you don't want to see that yeah. so yeah so that, i think that's good and it just uh hopefully this this has been helpful for for folks um i know i've learned a, a lot from you and thanks for letting me ask you a couple questions for sure um you're always you're always you always have really good information, so thanks for that. Appreciate it. And uh, hopefully this, the biggest thing I think I would love for people to take away is make sure that you do have that conversation early and often um, so you can explore your options rather than at some point having to be forced to make a decision. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, like you mentioned, you don't want to be the family that puts in the planning because the family down the road went through something that mm -hmm. was not pleasant. Yeah. take the steps early and often to get that plan in place and you avoid a lot of these headaches yeah so, perfect so stefan i want to put in some information in the show notes sure. how people can get a hold of you what's the best way to do that yeah you can uh, reach me uh s van santon at bridgelinewealth.ca jump on my linkedin you can uh, direct message me there and uh i think my contact information is will be in there too so i'll we'll drop my my phone number in there four zero three five one seven zero three nine eight i'm crazy can't believe i just did that <laughs> but there you go hopefully it'll be, that it'll was be in the, the show office notes. number and yeah. not the cell number. <laughs> all right well thanks again for hopping on the podcast yeah. doing a little banter back and forth mm -hmm. on some important succession planning uh topics and questions and hopefully this kind of three-part series was useful for the the listeners on a wide variety of topics yeah Thank you.